you've got your hair that color. Um, <laughs> I went blonde. This is on. Take it off mute. It's on mute. I don't know what to do. The mic is on. It's on. It's on mute. She had us put it on mute just now. Uh, Anne just said for us to put it on mute. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. Sorry. I think the audio is working. Yeah, perfect. Is that all you wanted me to do was hit it really hard? <laughs> I'm a little nervous. This is like my campaign's classroom, so I'm like, I feel like I'm back in yeah, campaign. Some PTSD. Yeah, <laughs> just being triggered. <laughs> You're all good. Take some deep breaths. You'll do great. Fantastic. So many kids here. Yeah. We um we've had three sessions thus far, and in three sessions, including one in Scripps downstairs, mm -hmm. there's been one seat open. No way. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. That's been, it's wow. been really, really great. I know. So very cool. blessed. I'm very blessed. I remember when we first started. Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it went from four days to three days, mm -hmm. and every day we tried to pack in as much as we could. Right. And I don't know. We're, we're now at three days. We're not going back to work, so it's yeah. crazy. But, yeah. Um, I think three days is, is good. Yeah. And that's it. Oh, no. Uh oh. You know is that a phase hoodie? <laughs> Oh no, I don't know what that means. It's another team. <laughs> you can call him out though. I will. Because <laughs> I get the bed. <laughs> Definitely call him out. I will. <laughs> Could you please get out? <laughs> and you're at Complexity Gaming, right? Yes. Okay. Did he tell you just to leave this right here, or you're supposed to hold this? Uh, I think you can hold it. Are yeah, you going to hold it? Yeah. Okay. Then I'll just give it back. Okay, I think we're ready to get started. So thank you all for joining us for the first session of the last day of Social Media Week 2020. Um, we have three great sessions today, um, and the first one is with Suki Park. Um, I will introduce Suki in just a second. Our next session will be at 1240, um, where we will learn all about the viral hashtag 9 p.m. routine. And then we will finish up today with an Ag Club PRSSA co-sponsored um, meeting featuring Caitlin Riddell from The Point Sky. So hopefully you can turn out for more than just one session today. Um, Suki is here. Suki um, was a graduate of the advertising program here in 2013. She just told me that she's a little nervous because this is where she um, presented her campaign's <laughs> final project. <laughs> I'll have PTSD. Yeah. <laughs> so I told her to take a deep breath. 
That's right. She's not getting judged or graded today, so that is a good thing for her. Um, Suki is here to talk to us about esports and marketing to a new generation, and she works at a company called Complexity Gaming. Um, and she's going to focus her presentation today on marketing and advertising strategies that have um, become more complex throughout the years, so much more than putting an ad on paper or TV. Um, she's going to talk about the rise of the internet, how digital factors into all this, and how to specifically target millennials and Gen Z um, through esports and a multi digital platform world. So, we are very happy to uh, welcome Suki back to Rocky Top, and um, she'll present and then take some questions um, towards the end. So, let's give Suki a big welcome. Hey guys, um, welcome. Thank you so much for turning out. Like, I honestly did not expect so many people here, um, but super happy to be back. I haven't been back in like five years, and so much has changed. I've actually got lost coming up here, so great start. Um, I'm actually going to keep things pretty casual. Um, so I will obviously have a Q&A session at the end, but in the middle of my presentation, if you guys have any like questions or anything like that, just please like let me know, and I'll, I'm happy to answer it um, in the middle of the presentation. So yeah, um, before I get started, I will just give a brief background about myself. Um, just like Dr. Childress said, I graduated in 2013 in advertising um, with a minor in business. And um, through a long and um, arduous journey, I finally landed a job, um, my dream job, doing esports marketing. So I actually grew up in Korea um, during the rise of esports um, video games, so like in the early 2000s. So I was really interested in doing video games for a living, but you know, back then it wasn't really a thing. Um, so I was also interested in traditional sports, so that's kind of where I pivoted my um, career, doing sports marketing. So after I graduated, um, I landed in New York at WMEIMG, um, which is one of the biggest sports marketing agencies in the world. Um, so I was on their Kia NBA account. And um, my job was to kind of be the liaison between Kia and our NBA partners. Mine was Madison Square Garden and the Philadelphia 76ers. Um, so through them, um, I really got to learn a lot about account management and doing things like that. And then uh, Philadelphia 76ers bought um, an esports team called Dignitas. So that was back in 2016. And being the nerd that I am, I was like, oh my God, this is like the perfect opportunity for me to just like insert myself. So I emailed my client, not looking for a job, but I just wanted to, you know, help them out as a nerd. So um, I just basically was like, hey, you know, I'm huge into esports. If you guys ever have any questions, let me know. And uh, they actually gave me a job. So <laughs> that's kind of how I started my esports career. Now I'm at Complexity Gaming. Um, and I'll kind of give you a little background on who we are as a team. So Complexity started in 20, uh, 2003, um, which makes us one of the oldest esports organizations in North America and in the world. Um, we are a household name in esports um, with 140 championships. And the coolest part is we are owned by uh, Jerry Jones, which, um, who owns the Dallas Cowboys. So our HQ is actually right across the street from the Dallas Cowboys HQ. We get to eat with the Dallas Cowboys. We get to um, train at Cowboys Fit. It's pretty awesome. Um, who would have thought this would be my life? So um, yeah, we're competing in about nine, 10 different games. Our biggest one being Counter-Strike. I don't know if you guys have heard of Counter-Strike, if you play Counter-Strike. Please cheer for us, we were playing this weekend. Um, so we have um, World of Warcraft, who we just won first, first place in this race to world first. I'm not a WoW person, so, but I know that we did awesome, so <laughs> that's good. Um, we have Rocket League, Fortnite, Madden, FIFA, um, Hearthstone, Apex, Magic the Gathering. Um, so a plethora of games. So. Before I get too deep into it, who all is familiar with esports, who all plays video games, watches on the reg? Okay, all right, cool. Um, so for those of you who don't know, I know this is like a wall of text, but esports basically is competitive video gaming. So um, let's just read through it for a second. Um, <laughs> so 
esports or video games, there's a lot of different ways you can make money in esports. Obviously, there's competitions where you go and play tournaments competitively, but there's also like another side to it, which is strictly streaming. I don't know if you, any of you guys heard of Ninja? Yes. So he's like, he doesn't compete, right? But he just is an online personality, basically a celebrity that makes his living off of just entertaining people. So that's kind of the industry overview. Um, so esports has been on the rise pretty recently, but it's been a thing since the 1970s um, when the first esports contest happened. Um, it was Space Wars, but I don't know. I wasn't born for that, so yeah. Um, but it got really big, like I said, around 2000s um, when StarCraft really was on the rise, um, especially in Korea, and now with um, Twitch TV, which was formerly Justin TV, um, and with esports really rising up from with League of Legends and Overwatch and all that stuff, um, it's been really getting really big. A lot of traditional sports um, teams are buying into esports. So, like I said, 76ers are the first North American traditional sports team to buy an esports team. We have um, Schalke, which is a um, professional soccer team in Germany. We have the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, everybody is buying into it because it's the next biggest thing. All right, so I'll just quickly glance over it. There's a lot of tiers um, into competitive gaming. So it's basically like, you know, your average um, traditional sports. You have the amateur leagues, you know, casual, or you can just, you know, like go out on a Sunday night, like to play soccer, but or you can get into the amateur leagues where you get paid maybe like $300 a month or something to play, um, all the way out to professional and international levels where people are literally making like hundreds and thousands of dollars. Um, I believe last year when Fortnite World Cup was happening, um, that was like the biggest prize pool and that the winner I believe made $3 million and he's 16. So yeah, it's a lot of money. Okay, so um, esports industry, there's a lot of components that make up the industry. So it's not just games and the teams, it's you know, leagues like the NBA, or NFL, M MLS, MLB, whatever. Um, and there's distribution platforms, which is where you buy your games. Um, league and event organizers, which is what I just said. Um, media that you know, bring us out the news about you know, trades or games or whatever. Um, broadcasting, which is where you stream your games um, or competitions. And then we have the sponsors and non-endemic sponsors, or endemic sponsors, which is, how would I describe this? Like industry sponsors. So for us, it would be like monitors, computers, peripherals, et cetera. And then non-endemic sponsors, which are the big money spenders, Coca-Cola, you know, Kia, Honda, whatever. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of people that make up this industry. So um, there's a lot of different genres in the in esports e too, right? Um, a lot of us are familiar with like first-person shooter games, strategy games, um, like Counter-Strike, StarCraft, whatever, um, MOBAs, like League of Legends. Um, but we also have like mobile gaming, sports games, like all sorts of stuff. Um, So let's get into the fun stuff. Um, so the audience, this is um, pretty interesting. Esports is growing so fast. Um, we're projecting it to take over football audience, soccer audience, um, basketball audience. Essentially, um, I'm trying to think of a number. So in 2016, um, the League of Legends World Championship Finals, the audience for that, um, the only other traditional sports event that beat that audience number was the World Cup Finals, um, if that kind of gives you a sense of how big this is. Um, the, that year, the World Championship was in Staples Center in LA, um, and that place sold out in 10 minutes. The semifinals, which was in New York, sold out in 45. That was in Madison Square Garden. So. People are going nuts about it. I mean, there are so many people playing it. Like it says on the screen, there are 2.3 2 billion consumers playing video games worldwide. 
That's 30% of the population. That's actually crazy. I'm one of them. So <laughs> um, it's a big market that people are trying to get into. Um, let's focus a little bit more into the U.S. 70% of the population between the ages of 13 to 44 watch or play video games. I mean, how many of you guys play video games on the regular? I'm pretty sure a lot. Yeah, so that's 128.7 million people. Um, it can be on mobile. Like, you could literally be playing Candy Crush. That's a video game. Like, I play... Candy Crush on the regular, so yeah. All right, so looking at the audience, the core demographic obviously is 16 to 28% mostly male. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, but where it gets really interesting is when you compare the people that play video games and are kind of invested in esports compared to the rest of the population. So 58% of the population are college graduates, um, highly educated and Excuse me, um, and they make a lot of money too. So they're making about a hundred thousand dollars per year compared to the U.S. average of fifty-two thousand um, dollars. So that's what makes the the gaming audience so interesting to non-endemic sponsors is that they have a lot of money to spend, but if you look, they don't really watch TV. Like, I I don't watch TV. I just literally go on Hulu or Netflix or Twitch or whatever. I never like turn on my TV even though I have AT&T. Um, so it's really hard for those endemic uh, non-endemic sponsors to reach this population. So um, yeah, like if you look at the stats, 50% of the people don't see cable service as important. They don't watch TV. They use ad blockers specifically to block out commercials when they're watching stuff online. I mean, I'm one of them. So um, it's, it's really hard to reach that audience. I mean, do you guys like watching like ads when you're doing stuff? I don't, so. Um, but what we found out during our research is that the number one reason that people watch our um, streamers or players or any of the esports is to see how they play and how to get better. Like if you had a chance, if you're a huge LeBron James fan and you had a chance to like watch LeBron James play and you get to ask him questions and be like, yo, like how do you do this? And he could literally just tell you, face, not face to face, but like just answer your questions. Like how many people would, you know, jump on that opportunity? So um, that's kind of what we find out, found out, and yeah. And besides that, you know, people like to watch esports. They like to watch the highlights, um, interviews, behind the scenes, things like that. But the main um, reason people watch these is because they want to learn how to get better. Any questions so far? I feel like I'm. What platform? Um, so I guess the biggest one is Twitch TV, which is a streaming platform. So sorry, I should have explained what Twitch is. So Twitch is, a, like I said, a streaming platform. So people will just go online and go live, um, and they play games or whatever they want to do. They don't even have to play games. They could be like cooking. They could be out at the bar. Like, they just live stream to however many people, you know, interacting with them. And at, at that point, they can, you know, fans or chat could ask them a question and they answer. But also, you can do that on, like, any social media, right? So if somebody, like, comments on your Twitter post or DMs you a question, like, that's how you interact. But mainly, it's through Twitch. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Right, so that's a great question. Um, I don't know if all of you guys heard, but she basically asked how these people actually answer all the questions um, when there's like a bajillion people watching. And the answer is it's really hard, um, obviously because the chat is just like going super fast. Um, but Twitch has kind of implemented a interesting ooh, system where um, you can donate money 
to like the streamer and have like an ad uh, a message pop up for you S or like you can highlight a message or whatever so it kind of helps them make money but it also gives the fan an opportunity to ask a question that might not not have gotten read does that make sense yeah great question though i should have mentioned that so um how do these people watch? I mean, I guess it kind of bleeds into it. So Twitch and YouTube are basically the two top two um, platforms that people watch on. Um, but if you look at, oh, <coughs> sorry. If you look at you know some of the research that we did, people are actually willing to pay subscription to like watch these. And um, I'm one of them, like I, my favorite streamer, I will pay $5.99 or $6.99 to be able to watch this person stream without like having any ads or you know being able to use that like subscription specific emote to make sure that everybody knows that I'm like connected to this person or whatever. Um, so yeah, any questions? Okay. So there's we've further kind of segmented the US audience to five different categories. First being mobile moms, um, which are moms that have kids that like to play games on their phones, um, which is a huge audience. Um, then gaming is life. Word speaks for itself. People that play video games their entire life. Um, legacy gamers, which are like the older generation that kind of still play games. Um, like the dad gamers, I guess, um, and then single ladies, you know, a lot of you guys, I guess. <laughs> um, and then fun with friends, which is, you know, um, people that play video games like socially. So, and that kind, this kind of further breaks it down. But let me see what I am. Hmm. I think I'm gaming is life, but I'm not single. So, yeah. I know this is a lot to read, so I'll kind of put it up here. Um, so for these different audience segments, there's different ways to really target them, right? So if you're reading down here, they have all different kinds of um, characteristics. So like gaming is life, these people want to dominate. They want to be like really good at their, you know, specific games. So this would mostly be like our professional video gamers that actually like go and compete and like do all this stuff. Um, and then legacy gamers would be, like I said, the dads that, you know, play Madden with their kids or CS with their kids or whatever. Um, fun with friends, social, um, single ladies. I can relate to this actually, but you just watch video games to escape the daily grind of, you know, being alive. <laughs> What's up? So uh, you spoke about how it's hard to reach audiences who perhaps maybe have some sort of mm -hmm. familiarity. I guess you could talk a little bit about um, what you personally hear or heard about what it is about their species who are engaging in gaming. So, so for example, some of the videos we had. Right. Yeah. So, so for like in game specifically? Right. Right. Yeah. 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 So I think it's <sighs> that's a good question. It depends on the game, actually. So, like for CS, like Counter Strike, sorry, um, it's really easy because the game. It depends on the game publisher and how much control they want to have over the game. So, like for League of Legends, you can't just like go out there and make a skin and like try to sell it. You have to like work through Riot. But Valve or like for Valve, you can actually like like for Dota 2, you can create a fountain banner or in-game whatever's. Yeah, to have it in there. So it really depends on the publisher. Um, but yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's it's tough, like because 
esports, there's not really a like physical platform that you can like sell against, right? So you got to get really creative um, on how you can like sell these things. So they're they're getting really creative about it for sure. So yeah, of course. Um, a little bit more um, on like the marketing research that we've done. Oh, um, so sponsorships that really resonate with these people. Um, commercial breaks, I guess, you know, you can't, you can't get away from it. So, um, but it's not just like any commercial break. It's like a Super Bowl commercial. You have to be really creative. You can't just like go out there and have like one person being like, hey, look at this like product. It's so awesome. It has to be like really engaging and really creative. Um, but what we found um, is that, oh, excuse me, where is it? I'm trying to find it. Oh, there it is. Like celebrity endorsed products or influencer endorsed products are really, they really resonate with um, this generation or these audiences because, I mean, if you see Ninja wearing like a Red Bull, Adidas, whatever, like kids are gonna wanna, you know, wear it too so that maybe they can play like Ninja. I don't know, so, but just to kind of really hammer it in there. Um, number one reasons fans watch is because they want to mimic the players and the pros and what like what items they use so that they can get better. So, so the next consumer powerhouse is you guys, the Gen Z, right? You guys Gen Z, right? Okay. Um, so 78% of the gener Gen Z people um, watch everything through their computers. When was the last time you guys ever like actually watched TV? Like, can you think of it, the last time you looked at your TV screen? Super Bowl? Yeah, same. Um, and they are going to be, or you guys will be comprising 32% of the global population. And well, you guys did um, in 2019, which is crazy. That's a lot of a lot of you guys. Um, so. That's a big market share that people want to um, have a slice of. And like I said, Generation Z makes so much freaking money for some reason. Um, especially the gamers, like I said, $100,000 household income compared to the $52,000 um, US average. So oh, how do we capture this audience that doesn't like, they, that don't look at TV, they don't like ads, like how do we capture this? audience, right? So like I briefly mentioned, um, there's not a lot of physical space that we can really like put our sponsors logos on. Um, but we make it work, one of them being the jersey inclusions. So this is like our jersey. Um, but what's interesting about esports jerseys is that if you watch an esports game, you don't like really see anything below like the chess level because they have like the face cam when they're like playing but you don't get to see like the bottom the you know back or anything like that so we have to get really creative so you can't really see it here but so like prime spots are like the shoulders and like the sleeves whereas like um if you look at like soccer jerseys their main sponsors are like right on the on the stomach right but <laughs> If you have that for esports, nobody is gonna look at it unless like you see them walking out and like sitting on their on their um, desks. So that's pretty much all we have for like physical space. Everything else is digital. So another thing that we that is really um, unique about esports compared to traditional sports is that we have full control over our players. So like if you wanted to use like, let's say Cristiano Ronaldo, like you have to actually like um, have a deal with him specifically and like pay him a bajillion dollars to like have him, you know, endorse your product. Whereas for us, we own our players likeness. So we can, this sounds so bad, we can basically tell them what to do, right? Um, so, these are some of our guys, um, our CS players, Fortnite Mobile, 
FIFA, big boy, yeah. Um, so how we use them, um, a lot of it is meet and greets and appearances. So that is like the favorite part of my job because I get to go to all these cool events with players and really get to experience a lot of stuff. So for example, um, when I was working at the 76ers with Dignitas, they flew me and um, three of our players out to Breckenridge, Colorado for due tour. So they got to like, we got to play video games in the cabin overlooking the mountains and then afterwards we got to like go snowboarding in Colorado. Like it was, it was pretty awesome guys. Like I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna lie. And um, last year I got to go to Posty Fest. Um, I don't know if you guys know what that is, but that's like a music festival hosted by Post Malone. Um, we brought two of our players there. Um, they actually got to present like a Post Malone HyperX wrapped um, Xbox to like a winner in front of the stage. I didn't, the players did. I just took pictures. But yeah, like things like that. Um, those are kind of like unique events that you can't really experience um, outside of esports, I think. That's, um, so yeah. And what's cool is, like I said, our sponsors get direct player access. So a lot of the sponsorships that we do with our team, um, we like to have like a research and development partnership. So if they, like if HyperX, which is a gaming peripheral um, partner, if, if they wanted to like, let's say create this like freaking keyboard that lights up and breaks apart and comes together however they want. Um, they have direct player access to our players um, to send them products. We let them try it out, give feedback, and they basically create, you know, their product based on our feedback, which is awesome because, you know, especially for gaming peripherals or gaming chairs for that matter, like, at the end of the day, the people that are using it are gamers, and what better way to you know get feedback than from you know the world's best players? <laughs> this being another. Okay, so lastly, um, digital assets. Like I said, no, we don't have any physical assets, so digital is kind of the way for us to engage with our um, with our fans. Um, the easiest way to do it is basically brand inclusion, right? So having, let's see here, having sponsor logos on, you know, our website, having like a pre-roll, like not a commercial, but logo before like our YouTube content or having like our brand on Twitter headers or anything of that sort, um, that's like super basic, right? Like it, you don't really get a lot of engagement, but there's a lot of impressions. So, yeah. Um, and then going deeper into social media, we do a lot of things on social media because a lot of people are on social media. It's, it's huge. So um, when we use social media, we, do, we found out that like, giveaways are probably the biggest way to attract like engagement and having people know and find like affinity to our sponsors because they're giving away things for free. Like, how are you not gonna like that? Um, so like for Christmas, we did a huge holiday giveaway. We gave away a $500 monitor, a $1,200 like um, graphics card, um, like $500 worth of like gaming peripherals to like one person and it wasn't me, but yeah, they really liked it. So I'm really jealous of that one. Um, but like for social media, we do like we do a lot of other stuff too. Like we help promote things that is going on with them. We do a lot of like, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Uh, like for hmm, for uh, last year for like. Black Friday, we will help them like promote their Black, Black Friday deals or like things like that. Um, any questions so far? No? Okay. So Twitch integration. Um, this is kind of like the biggest part. Like I said, streaming is huge in eSports. So we really are trying to get creative on how we can integrate partners into this. So. 
So like, I'm trying to see oh, where it is. We have like brand integration, like just logo placement. Um, we have chatbots, which is like just robots that every like 90 seconds or so has like a sponsored, you know, whatever phrasing or whatever um, with a click through link that people can click to to get to whatever. Um, but that's just the basics. Like we can go as complicated as doing like a Twitch takeover, which is when one brand partner, if they wanted to like take do like, let's say like T-Mobile comes in and they're like, we want to do like T-Mobile Tuesdays. And then we basically make everything T-Mobile. We have like banners and in-game like graphics that has to do with T-Mobile, make it magenta pink, like just go crazy and give out things on Twitter, uh, Twitch. And like you can get as complicated or as simple as just putting a logo on there. So the limit, the, there is no limit to what you can do on stream. Um, so yeah. Let me see. So just to give you like how much impressions we have, um, like you see here, we have over 200 million viewer minutes per month. That's how many people like tune in for how, like that's how long people tune in to our streams. We have like 80 players or whatever um, that stream daily. They have two, two million people following them on Twitch. So like that's two, mil two million people that our partners can reach to. So, yeah. This is my favorite part, custom content and experiential. So content is basically king in eSports. Like you have to really, um, I'm saying creative a lot, which is really annoying, but um, you have to get creative to, in order to capture our, um, our fans. Like you can't just be like, hey, have a Miller Lite and people will be like, okay, like I'll have a Miller Lite. You have to like really kind of engage them in a different way. So um, I'm gonna kind of show you guys before I get into it too deep, like one of the things that we did. Actually, before I start this. So another interesting thing about esports and esports teams is that one fan of one game isn't going to be following all the rest of the games, right? So like if you're a Rocket League fan, you're not gonna like automatically follow our CS team. So it's very like scattered, but so it's challenging to like bring them together. Um, but we kind of work with our partners to kind of figure out how we can bring two separate games together without alienating like either of the audiences. So. This is kind of what we came up with with Miller Lite.
the first game I ever cared about, though, because I don't really want to count that. The first game I ever cared about was like Super Smash Bros. Really? Smash? My first game I cared about was Pokemon on Game Boy. I was so into that. Like, I had to play all day, like, from school or after school. No, I just have, like, the end along the game. Yeah, the first game we had. Oof. Mine was, I fell out Xbox uh, 360. And it was, you know, people put it's, like, I, T, Z, or they put the name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it's. Uh, no. Yeah, so this is the kind of content that we're trying to strive for um, when it comes to like partnered content. Um, it's not like a blatant commercial where, you know, you see on TV where, you know, like the celebrities are just like going to a bar and like cheersing for like 30 seconds. It's actually like a story that we can relate our fans to um, that, you know, the fans want to see like the behind the scenes stories of how Rush, um, our Counter-Strike player, won the major just so you know when you win a major, you win like 500K um, straight up. So like things like that or, you know, Rush or not Rush, Roland meeting Ninja and things like that. Um, it's just things that people want to hear about. And I think that's kind of the future of not just esports, but like how people and other like brands are going to take their marketing um, is to create content like that. Um, so. Yeah, um, for, let's see. And for experiential, um, there's a lot of different things, but I think the sort of, just to give you kind of an example of what I've worked on um, in terms of experiential is, so like for Buffalo Wild Wings, um, we did a 1v1 like League of Legends match at TwitchCon, which is a huge, um, gaming convention hosted by Twitch in LA. So we brought two of our like League of Legends players out there to do like a show match. Um, after like the winner got to come to like Buffalo Wild Wings with the players, like with the League of Legends players and like got to sit with them and eat and drink with them and like talk to them about, you know, their life and games and things like that. Um, but the coolest thing that I've done is with the US Army. Um, so right now we're partnered with the U.S. Army their, and their BOSS program, which is like better opportunities for single soldiers. Um, so we're not like partnered with the recruiting side, but with like the ar side of the army that helps retain like good morale for the soldiers that are there. So um, what I've learned is that when you're in the army and you're like stuck in the barracks in the middle of like nowhere, Texas, it gets really depressing. Um, so um, as, as sad as it sounds, there's a lot of, you know, suicide and depression um, in the military, and we're trying to use video games to kind of boost morale. Um, so what we've done last year is we brought players to these um, bases. So last year we went to Fort Bliss, Fort Sill, Fort Hood. Um, we did like Madden tournaments, Fortnite tournaments, um, and we brought like the top 12 people to our headquarters in Frisco, Texas. Um, that is decked out in like state of the art, you know, video game tech things. Um, and we got them to boot camp with our players. They got to scrim with our players. They got to learn from our coaches on how to be a better player. And then we did um, a tournament. So um, if you guys aren't familiar with the star, um, which is like the, which we call Jerry World. Um, it's like a huge eight mile long um, complex that has like all these cool like restaurants and there's like a to what's called the Tostitos Plaza which is like a kind of like a half um, football field. Um, so we had um, a tournament out on Tostitos Plaza. We flew in casters, we flew in our Madden player, 
Um, and we had NFL alumni that came and like watched the VIP watch party, um, but we had like a giant tournament that like hundreds and thousands of people out on Tostitos Plaza watched um, as our soldiers battled it out um, on Madden. So things like that, like you can make it big scale like that or you can make it as small as like doing a sweepstakes and bringing um, players in for like a meet or fans in for a meet and greet. Um, but those things are kind of my favorite. I love doing like event planning and stuff. So yeah, um, that's kind of the biggest um, ways that our partners can reach fans. But that's all I have. I'm going to open it up to you guys now for any questions. No? I'm gonna wait for a mic. You don't need one? Um, so would you, if you own their likeness, how do they make money? Like, like, do they make money whenever they stream or whatever? I'm super confused on like how all that works. How, how we use player likeness? <laughs> well, I mean, they make salary, right? Like, right. like any other. So they um, get paid by complexity? Mm hmm Okay. So we, you know, give our players a monthly salary, um, but they also, you know, get earnings from tournaments. They make money through Twitch. Um, yeah. So, does that kind of answer your question? Right. Do, you, have a do you all like take a portion of their earnings since you do own them technically? So that depends um, by team. Some teams take part of like the tournament earnings. Some teams <laughs> let the players have it. So. I think for us, um, I think it depends on the teams, too. Yeah. Sweet. Thank you. Of course. What's the incentive to join the team? Um, so I, w I can't speak for all of eSports teams, but I'll just speak specifically about ours. Um, so f complexity is very unique in that we're kind of the front runners of what we call eSports 3.0. So eSports 1.0 was you in your mom's basement drinking Mountain Dew and eating Doritos playing video games. eSports 2.0 is when teams realize that, you know, we need to bring the gamers together and, you know, put them in a house, have them, you know, play and compete and eat and sleep in the same house, things like that. eSports 3.0, which is where we're at now, is that we realize that putting them in the same house where they compete and practice is so bad for your mental health and for like a team dynamic. Because if I were to be in a team that I could not get away from, like if I had to be with them for 24 hours, I would literally kill them. So like <laughs> we want to really focus on how we can um, improve that team dynamic as well as how, like, the scientific ways of how we can help them perform better. Um, so what we've done is we have our HQ, which is our practice facility as well. So we have, like, a training room that's basically decked out to look like and mimic what it's like to play on stage. We have, like, strobe lights. We have crowd noise that we can turn on and off, like, um, state-of-the-art technology, like, everything like that. But they don't live in the same house. We have a apartment complex that's about a mile away from our HQ. Um, we put them in luxury apartments. Each of them have their own um, apartment rooms or whatever. Um, but we also partnered with Mamba Sports Academy, which is a um, sports performance company that is um, owned by Kobe Bryant um, that helps with kind of performance enhancing. So we have like um, um, different games that our players can play before practice that like helps increase like eye-hand-eye hand -eye coordination, like reaction speed, inhib inhibition. So like when to shoot, not to shoot, whatever. Um, things like that. We also have a partnership with our sports performance center, which is like a hospital that's right across the street um, that if our players have like carpal tunnel or if like for example, one of our mobile Fortnite players, Ducky, he's 19 and 
when we signed him, we took him to the performance center, and he we found out that he lost like 20% of his like mobility in his shoulders because of how he was like playing on his iPad. So we're working with the hospital to like help him, you know, rehab his shoulder and things like that. Um, but and I also like touched on it, but we. They have access to nutritionists. They have access to personal trainers. Um, they get to eat meals with, you know, freaking Dallas Cowboys players. Um, they have free membership to the gym. Like that kind of level of care that our players receive, you can't do it if, like, if you're on your own, right? So that's kind of how we recruit our players: is the amount of access that they get for their well, their well-being, and the amount of like. Hmm, like focus and attention that they get. So, yeah. Do you think with the way that the Call of Duty League has restructured, do you think that'll become more of like a mainstream thing with like home and away and like every team kind of having a home arena? Do you think that's something that'll continue to happen in more games as esports continues that's a to grow? Great question. Wait, are you the one that's wearing the face hoodie? Yes. I'm not <laughs> answering your question. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, I, I, that's an interesting question. I think, I think it'll be, it's, it's difficult, because I, I, we haven't really seen it happen like full, circ, like full cycle yet. Um, I think it's an interesting concept. Um, we'll see. I mean, <laughs> it's, hard to, it's hard to kind of project the future at the moment, yeah. Sorry, that's kind of a bad question, but you're wearing a bad hoodie, so. <laughs> or bad answer, sorry. I'm kidding, by the way. Don't take it personally. <laughs> Anybody else? No? Are we done? Did I make that good of a presentation that nobody any questions about esports? <laughs> Is that a question? Okay. Game chat era. What okay. are you guys doing to limit the vulgarity that is in game chats? Vulgarity that is in game chats? Yeah, like the cyberbullying, basically. Right. Yeah. Um, that's a good question, and honestly, that's like something that I personally have a passion for, um, especially as a female in gaming. Um, the amount of toxicity that I receive um, as a female, it really sucks. Um, but I think it's all about like education. Um, so to speak about like females in gaming specifically, um, and the amount, of, like the kind of toxicity. I think um, it's a tough question to answer. Um, Does complexity do anything directly? Like, do they have any? Yeah, yeah. So we are trying to like make sure that. Let me let me gather my thoughts for a second. One second. No so for for females in esports or like bullying, um, I think. <laughs> sorry, I'm trying to like. I, there's a lot of things going on in my mind. Um, we're trying to like educate the fans that, like, we're not trying to keep, like, females or victims of bullies in a bubble, like, like wrap them up in a blanket and, like, be like, everything's okay. We're trying to really tackle it head on um, by, like, creating content that, like, shows that we can be on the same, like, playing field as guys, right? So, like, um, we're not necessarily saying that like if you shame what you call like quote unquote like titty streamers like if we're not saying that like condemning them is bad and like we ban them from you know chat or whatever but we're trying to uh, like 
show them, like create content that like portray them as like a fellow human being that just really enjoys like video games just as much as anybody else. Like, does that kind of make sense of what I'm like what I'm trying to say? I like, got you. yeah. Um, it we don't really. We're not really there yet on like how what the like correct answer is for um, tackling bullying because with the internet being so like anonymous, you can literally say whatever you want and kind of get away with it, um, which sucks. But um, there's a lot of steps that are being taken to um, stop with bullying. I talk about like female and gaming a lot just because like that's my personal passion, um, but. I think right now with like having girl like female leagues, um, I think that's like kind of a it might be a controversial opinion, but I think that's kind of an important start to show that like women can freaking game too. Like we're not just you know looking pretty and trying to like garner guys' attention through streaming. Um, but eventually, I think that needs to go away. Like female only gaming. Um, I think right now it's a good step to show that like girls can game just as well as guys do. Um, but eventually, I want it to be a world where like girls can compete in guys' leagues, and like when they walk out, I don't like guys will be like, okay, like she made it, like she's she's one of us kind of thing, instead of being like, oh, like go go back to your kitchen and you know like make me a sandwich kind of thing. So um, yeah, I kind of I hope that kind of helps answer your question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of ways to get into the industry that are more than just the players. And you've spent a long time right. talking about the players. And obviously, you do something other than play the game. Yeah. So all the students in the room, how, how do I, what, what do I do now? So what do I do now to get a job or to break into the industry, um, especially as it's growing so rapidly? Right. Um, that's a great question. So. There's a lot of ways to get into esports. You don't have to be a gamer, in fact, to get into esports. Um, if you enjoy social media, you can be a social media manager. If you like being, um, if you like like account management, you can be like me and join the partnerships team. Um, you can go into player management where you help scout and take care of players and you know all that stuff. You can be an accountant, you can be an HR person, you can literally do whatever your heart desires. Um, but I think the best thing to do um, to get a job in esports is to really create your brand on social media. Um, I think, and like cultivate relationships and network. And that sounds really cliche, but like, let me just like give you an example of how one of my coworkers got his job. He literally like printed out a resume. He printed out like hundreds of resumes and went with his own money, bought a ticket to, I wanna say TwitchCon, um, from North Carolina. And he bought his TwitchCon ticket, he bought a hotel, he bought his flight, he went there, literally walked around and like started handing out resumes and trying to like talk to people. Um, and he made a lot of connections, and he works at our facility now. So, like, you ha like do whatever it takes um, to you know cultivate relationships. Um, and then for social media, um, if you're interested in getting a job, um, I highly recommend starting a Twitter um, Twitter page, Twitter profile, um, and really kind of manage your voice um, like you don't have to be talking about esports 24 7 you could like you could be like me and you just like post pictures of your dogs or like my pink hair or whatever but like just to like be out there and like to show people um, who you are I think that's really important especially because esports is digital everybody um, is digital so yeah anything else a big round of applause for joining <laughs> us. And I don't know if you've looked outside, but there are some really white, big, fluffy flakes coming down. Um, so 
what better to cure the coldness and the snowy weather than to maybe eat some warm chili and baked potatoes and salad. So we have lunch and brownies too. Uh, we have lunch. If you want a free lunch, just come this way behind me. We're going to enter into the room this way, okay? Thank you again, Suki. Come get your lunch too, okay?